At this point, I want to shift from talking about ethics to talking about metaphysics much more broadly. David Hume is an empiricist, and so it would be natural to include him in the part of the course right at the beginning, when we are talking about empiricism, this thought that all knowledge comes from experience. But Hume is a particular kind of empiricist. He thinks empiricism leads you to a sort of idealism. And so that's why I put him in this part of the course. He's partly idealist, partly empiricist, partly a skeptic. And we're going to see all of those dimensions. So really, on my nice fourfold classification of philosophers, he's somebody who doesn't really quite belong in any one category. He sort of belongs on some of the lines, <laughs> which makes him hard to analyze. But it also means that what Hume does, really, is begin with a certain insight, a certain insight about knowledge and ideas coming from experience that he takes over from Locke and from Berkeley. And then he pushes that very consistently in a certain direction and ends up with highly skeptical conclusions. So it's a surprising transformation, as we'll see. And here's what happens. Hume is one of the main figures of the 18th century, a key figure in the Scottish Enlightenment. We've talked a little bit about him before. Here is his masterwork, a Treatise of Human Nature, which he published when he was in his early 20s. Nobody paid it much attention. He later complained that it fell still more from the press and ended up writing a much smaller work that <coughs> expressed its key ideas. But today, it's considered one of the great classics of the Western philosophical tradition. And there you can see my own copy of it, well-loved and well-marked up, almost falling apart. He starts with Locke's idea that we gain simple ideas from experience. He says, they come from simple impressions. Impressions are our perceptions, sensations of the world outside, but also of our inner states of mind. And they come from, uh, sorry, those are the impressions, they generate simple ideas. So I have an experience, I get an idea. The ideas are typically complex, as are the perceptions. But those perceptions consist of simple components. And so do ideas. The complex ideas consist of simple components. So he says, all of our simple ideas in their first appearance are derived from simple impressions, which are correspondent to them and which they exactly represent. So here's the idea. In general, it says, this is the empiricist method. We take complex ideas and we break them down into their simple components, the simple ideas that make them up. Then we find the origins of those simple ideas in experience. So they're all generated from certain impressions. I trace them back to the impressions from which they come. And what is the content of the idea? It's to be found in those impressions. So I've got some complicated idea, and I think, what on earth is the content of that idea? I trace it back to the impressions for which it comes, and there it is. Now, in the case of something that applies to experience, this is very simple. I have the concept of burnt orange. And where does that come from? Well, it comes from impressions of burnt orange. And so what's the content of the idea? Well, it's that color. Okay? So the content is simply to be defined in terms of the impressions that I would classify as being burnt orange. And so in the case of perception, it's very, very simple. It gets tricky when I have something abstract or rather remote from experience. Suppose I'm talking about the idea of infinity or the idea of God, or as we'll see, the idea of necessary connection or the idea of causation. He then says, actually, it's kind of hard to trace that back to the impression from which it comes. And that will tell us something important about the content of the ideas. Here's why it's different. He says all ideas are relatively weak. Impressions are strong. If I want to know what burnt orange is, I can look and see something that's burnt orange, and that has a force and vivacity, he says, that impresses itself in the mind. But if you're not looking at anything colorful, uh, and you're just thinking about burnt orange, it has much less force and vivacity. It's something that feels much weaker. Ideas are like that in general. They tend to be faint and obscure, and the abstract ones, worst of all, he says. The mind has but a slender hold of them. And that's why it's so difficult to keep our ideas straight why it's so easy to become confused. We don't typically trace things back to their origins to find out their true content. Ideas are relatively weak, easy to get them confused with one another. So, he says, what we do is trace them back to the impressions. The impressions are strong. They're vivid. They are things that are easy to identify. It may be difficult to distinguish in your mind burnt orange from, gosh, what's a similar color? Maybe bright orange? Yeah, if I'm just thinking about that in the abstract and thinking, where does the line between bright orange and then burnt orange consist? That can be a little fuzzy. But if I look at some examples, it's very easy. I, I look at a UT uniform and look at a Tennessee uniform, <laughs> and I say, oh, wow, it's really easy to tell the difference between those two colors, even though they're both UT. Once I was on an airplane headed to Knoxville, and somebody said, oh, are you from UT? And I said, you bet. I thought, 
wow, Texas is famous enough that people on airplanes see you look and you know, immediately know where I teach at. I realize, oh, they met at the University of Tennessee. Um, but anyway, they couldn't tell their origins apart, obviously. Now, here's the problem, in a sense. We have that clear and distinct at the level of impressions, but as soon as we move to ideas, and the more abstract the ideas are, the worse this becomes, it's hard to tell what the contents are. It's easy to get confused. So here he says it's a method for getting clear about our ideas. He says, when we entertain any suspicion that a philosophical term is employed without any meaning or idea, which is too frequent, we need but inquire from what impression is that supposed idea derived. And if it be impossible to assign any, this will serve to confirm our suspicion. By bringing ideas into so clear a light, we may reasonably hope to remove all dispute which may arise concerning their nature and reality. So here's the idea. You've got somebody presenting an idea to you, and you're not sure whether there's really anything to this or not. Hume says, exactly. It's very hard to tell just thinking about the idea. Trace it back to the impressions. Ask what would actually be a real world example where my perception would allow me to apply that idea. And if somebody can't do that, the idea doesn't have any content at all. But sometimes, even if they can do that, it would turn out that it leads you to a place you didn't expect. So, let's take a look at what is legitimate things that can be traced back and understood. He says there are really two kinds of knowledge. There are things he calls relations of ideas. In our terminology, or for Kant, that's really a question of analytic and a priori judgments. They're all about the relations of ideas. This consists of logic, things that are true by definition. And mathematics, he says, is like this. It's really, in the end, all true by definition and logic. And then there are the things that are synthetic and a posteriori that directly pertain to the world and are coming from experience that he calls matters of fact. That's where natural science, history, and a variety of other uh, disciplines that actually look at the content of the world consist. But that's it, there's nothing else. So everything is either a relation of ideas established analytically and a priori, or it's a question of empirical investigation. It is synthetic and a posteriori, like natural science, like history, describing what actually goes on in the world. Well, that's all there is, there's nothing else. And so if you've got anything that you're suspicious of, he says it's very simple. Apply a test and find out whether this has any content at all. So here is one of his most famous passages. This is from the shorter work, The Inquiry, not from the treatise, but it's very powerful. When we run over libraries, persuaded of these principles, what havoc must we make? If we take in the hand any volume of divinity or school metaphysics, for instance, let us ask, does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quantity or number? No. Does it contain any experimental reasoning concerning matter of fact or existence? No. Commit it then to the flames, for it can contain nothing but sophistry. So he envisions going into the library and saying, all right, does this book contain mathematics? If it does, OK, good. It's all about relations of ideas, and it's got content. Is it about empirical science? And he is himself a historian, so this includes history for him, as well as what we think of as the sciences, biology, chemistry, physics, and so on. If it's got that in it, fine. But what about these other things? What about these philosophical things? Like, oh God, being can be said in many senses. <laughs> there are many ways in which a thing can be said to be. A thing might be a substance, or a property of a substance, or a relation among substances, or a time, or a place, or an action, or affection, etc. Aristotle's metaphysics, in short. Is that something that contains abstract reasoning concerning quality or number? No. Does it contain experimental reasoning concerning matter, fact, or existence? No. Commitment to flames. So Hume is essentially saying, look, there are only two ways of having content, two ways of having knowledge. There is this relations of ideas way, there's the empirical science way, there's nothing else. And so if anything else pretends to be knowledge, it is garbage. Throw it in the trash, burn it. It is not doing anything. It is just there to confuse you. Now, he comes to other more skeptical <laughs> conclusions as well. So let's go back to Leibniz's arguments for rationalism. Remember Leibniz said, wait a minute, I don't see how it's possible to generate all of our knowledge merely from experience alone, without the help of innate ideas and without the help of some a priori principles. Why? Well, think about universality. We think we know all sorts of things that are universal. And even outside of mathematics, force is mass times acceleration, says Newton. And that's supposed to be true at all times, for all places, for any particles that are being moved or accelerated. So we can say, look, uh, we think we have universal knowledge, but all of our experience is particular. And so how could it be that on the basis of particular experiences, 
we get universal knowledge. It looks like the universal could never come out of a particular from a strictly logical point of view. Something else has to be added, and that something else has to be a priori. The same thing is an argument he uses about necessity. All of our experience is contingent. It could have gone that way. It could have gone some other way. But the contingent never entails the necessary, unless it's just a question of relations of ideas. Uh, but get those, push those aside. There's never anything substantive that is necessary that's going to follow from the contingent. So if we have any necessary knowledge, we actually think that if I, for example, observe a force on this object, um, that it's got to accelerate. Um, or that if we see an object accelerating, there must be a force applied to it. That must, that has to, is something that expresses necessity. Where could it be coming from? It's got to be coming from some a priori principle, said Leibniz. Well, there is a way in which Hume agrees with that and says, yeah, <laughs> you're right. It's going to be very hard for us to get to universality or to necessity on the basis of experience alone. So let's think about applying our empiricist test to those ideas the ideas of universality and necessity. He says, here's what's going on. We move from the particular to the universal. In cases of induction, I see a crow and it's black. I see another crow and it's black. I conclude after a while that all ravens are black, that all crows are black. Now, what is allowing me to do that? I'm going from the particular cases I've observed to generalizations, to general truths, to universal truths even. But now, Hume says, well, think about Leibniz's question. What actually justifies that move? It doesn't follow logically. After all, it could be that the next crow I encounter is not actually black. And I mentioned that this actually happened with swans. People follow this basis that all swans were white. And then in the middle of Australia, they found some black swans. So it could turn out that the next one is not like this. So it surely doesn't follow as a matter of logic. But now, according to the <laughs> rationalists like Leibniz, there must be some innate idea or principle that is underlying it. Hume says, uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, I don't see what that could be. What could possibly be the principle that underlies that? Something I've observed sometimes always happens? That's plainly not true. That's not the right principle. And so he says, actually, here's the dirty secret. What lies behind it is nothing rational at all. Okay, There is nothing rational that leads me from instances to the generalization, from the particular to the universe. I get there, true. But he says, it's nothing in, as a matter of reason that allows me to get there. So let's take a case, actually several cases here that he mentions. All observed ravens have been black, so all ravens are black. That doesn't follow as a matter of logic. It could turn out to be false. Moreover, it's the kind of thing where if I say, well, wait a minute, um, there must be some a priori principle. What could it be that whatever I've observed always happens? But that does, that's not true, right? Are there things you've observed that then turn out not to happen? Actually, yesterday's election violated many long-standing <laughs> principles that we like, well, it's always the case that blah, blah, blah. That turned out to be an exception. Uh, almost every political scientist, pollster, and so on is eating crow this morning. <laughs> um, well, that's a joke about ravens and crows. Never mind. Um, I thought that was a clever Hume joke, obviously. A philosopher's idea of a clever joke is not the same as other people's idea of a clever joke. But anyway, yeah, that's something that you know shows that, look, that, if that's the underlying a priori principle, it's false. That can't be the way we get there. Here's another example. When I've eaten bread, I've found it nourishing. So bread is nourishing. Well, it's a perfectly legitimate inference that we would make all the time. On the other hand, is it always the case that the next bit of bread you have not be nourishing? Um, you know, it could be. Actually, I was on my honeymoon at a, at a New Hampshire inn with my new wife, and they're sitting in the middle of the table with these beautiful rolls. And so I reached out and took one of the rolls. It was sort of difficult. They were kind of stuck together. I pulled off the roll and bit into it. While everybody else at the table just stared at me. And I was like, oh, this is. I, I mean, I didn't say this. I was trying to be nice to our hosts and to other people. But I was thinking, this is the stalest grip I have ever eaten. It's like a rock. Now, everyone else was staring at me because this was a centerpiece. This was a work of art. Okay, <laughs> people put these rolls together and then shellac them, varnish them, and so on. So they look shiny and beautiful as if they had just come from the oven. But they were not nourishing at all. They've been sitting there for months. Okay? <laughs> and so here I am, I'm taking this shellac bit of dough and. You know, 
So that bread was not nourishing. In fact, it's probably good. I didn't swallow all of that shellac. I might have been dead. But in any event, that could happen, right? And so again, we can go from a perfectly good set of instances to a generalization. But that doesn't mean the next bit of bread I encounter will actually be nourishing. Or what about this one? When the sun sets, it rises the next morning. So the sun always rises. Well, so far, that's been working out pretty well for us. But presumably, in the fullness of time, there will be a day when that doesn't happen. In any case, here's the way Hume is thinking about it. There's a sort of scandal. He says, if we think about what underlies this pattern of inductive reasoning, a pattern that underlies really all of our knowledge of the world, everything that's a knowledge of matters of fact, rather than a knowledge of relations of ideas, we find out, first of all, it can't have an a priori justification. It's not the case that everything we've observed always continues to be true. It's not the case that something that's always happened in the past is going to continue forever in the future. And so there isn't any necessity here. We can't have an a priori principle that says anything like that. It would be false. So there's no a priori justification we can give for this move from the particular to the universal. But he says there can't be an a posteriori justification for it either. Why not? It would be an appeal to experience. I would say, you know, inductive reasoning. Why do I continue to engage in it? Well, it's always worked well for me in the past, so I infer that it will always work well in the future. That's just another case of inductive reasoning. And so any such appeal would be circular. That can't work either. So Hume says, look, I can't have an a priori justification for this. I can't have an a posteriori justification of this based on experience. That would just be another appeal to experience. And the whole question is what makes it legitimate to appeal to experience to support a generalization. So that's just what an issue is. What is an issue? That is a circular bit of reasoning. So I'm stuck. I can't find a rational justification for this at all. It can't be a priori. It can't be a posteriori. But there's nothing else. Everything is one or the other. Either it depends on experience or it doesn't. And so I'm out of luck. I can't find any rational justification for this at all. So what applies to universality here also applies to causation, and it applies to necessity. So it's going to be a problem as soon as I start thinking about causal relationships. He says, I'm always going to be dependent upon the idea of that, as he puts it here, the future will be conformable to the past. So what's happened up to now will keep on happening. But what justifies that general assumption? It can't be a priori, because sometimes what's happened in the past doesn't happen. And so we get surprised. That's possible, so it can't be a priori. Can it be a posteriori? Well, then I've got to say, well, it's always worked out in the past for me to assume that what happened in the past is going to continue in the future. First of all, it doesn't always work out. But secondly, even if it did, that would end up being circular. So it can't work. Now, he says, look, it's a serious problem. And if you think about it another way, you can see why it's so puzzling. Suppose we have two things that are constantly controlled, like heat and flame, for example, or weight and solidity, or by dropping something and then it falling. That's something that seems to happen again and again. So as soon as I perceive the one, I tend to expect the other. If you show me a flame, I'm going to expect it to be hot. If you drop something, I'm going to expect it to fall. If there's some object I see that seems solid, I'm going to expect it to have some weight. Well, he says, look, what, we, what happens here is we draw from a thousand inferences, something we would never draw from just one instance alone. And reason is incapable of that variation. So that tells us something pretty rad. Look at this. Consider these two inductive arguments. This flame is hot, therefore all flames are hot. How good is that for us? Let's say you encounter one flame. It's not very good, right? Well, let's take it, I mean, we've seen so many flames that it's hard to think about that. But suppose you've encountered one, something just once. What's something you've encountered just once? Yeah. Say New York. Okay, New York. You've only been there once. So what was it like? Um, crowd. Crowd, okay. So can you, he went to New York once, he found a crowd. Can we infer that New York is always crowded? Actually, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's not a very convincing one. Let me think. Uh, <laughs> all right, well, yes. Um, I didn't apply to Harvard University when I was applying to colleges. Why not? Because I met a guy from Harvard. I had only met one, but he was a complete jerk. Okay? Uh, I was introduced to this guy, so I said, hey, I'm a high school or something. And, and he responded, F you. 
<laughs> I sort of thought, oh, that's what Harvard's like, huh? Uh, and so I drew this inference. This one Harvard student is a jerk, so all Harvard students are jerks. Well, was that a very good inference? I've met other people from Harvard since. They weren't jerks. So, no, that wasn't that good an inference, though it did affect the way I acted. <laughs> um, but now, if I have lots of instances, my judgment changes. For example, this flame is hot, but so is this one, so is this one, so is this one. Then I infer all flames are hot, and it seems pretty reasonable. I go to New York frequently, I say, gosh, where are we going to New York? It's crowded. And then I conclude something about New York on the basis of that experience. Um, and that seems reasonable. Or you meet lots of Harvard students, and they're all jerks, and then you say, oh, these Harvard students are jerks. And then it would seem like a plausible inference. So in short, from one instance, if you jump to the universal, that, all, that strikes us all as a, an over hasty generalization. On the other hand, if you do it from many instances, that seems quite plausible. That seems acceptable. But now why? He says reason can supply no explanation for why something that doesn't follow in one case follows from a bunch of different cases. After all, you've got essentially the same type of premise repeated again and again. So reason doesn't explain that. If I'm doing geometry, I do a proof about a triangle, and it's not like, well, yeah, you show the triangle ABC, uh, DEF, here's DEF, show it for that. You think, oh, come on, if I gave you the proof for one triangle, I've got a proof for all triangles. However, in this case, it looks like the number makes a difference. But how could reason do that? He ends up saying it couldn't. This is a sign that this sort of reasoning depends on custom. It depends on habit. It is not a question of reason. So here is his analysis in the end. I make causal inferences going from cause to effect or effect to cause. I see the lightning and I expect the thunder. Or I hear the thunder and infer that there must have been lightning. But what justifies that? Well, it's not a priori. Just as in the case we've seen before going to universality, we could imagine it otherwise. I can imagine seeing lightning that produces no thunder or thunder that came from no lightning. It's not a posteriori. We don't experience the causal link. And here's the difference in this argument, why it's not just exactly another application of the particular to universal argument. He says, where's the causal link? I see the link. I hear the thunder. What connects them? Do I see the link? No. I just see the lightning, and then I hear the clap of thunder. But I don't see the connection. Right? It might be different if I could somehow see that causal link, but I don't do it. Or I'm playing pool, and I shoot the cue ball, and it hits into the eight ball. The eight ball moves as a result of the motion of the cue ball. And so I see the cue ball move, then I see the eight ball move, and I think the one caused the other. But did I see the causation? Was it sort of like, here's the cue ball moving to the eight ball. There it goes, and all of a sudden, I see something happen. It's like a little explosion. And no, I don't see that connection, right? I just see the one motion, then the other motion. I don't see the connection. And so it looks like, basically, life is just one damn thing after another. I never see the connections between the things. So he says, when, I, when we look at ballast or external objects and consider causes, we're never able, in a single instance, to discover any power or necessary connection. Anything that, ab that binds the effect to the cause renders one an infallible consequence of the other. Ah, and so I've got another Simpson clip that I had forgotten about. Oh, but it's not playing. Well, skip it. Okay, we only find that one does not, um, well, sorry, one does actually follow the other. It doesn't follow logically from the other. If I just say this ball moves, it doesn't follow as a matter of logic that this ball will move. But in practice, it does follow, right? The one event always follows the other. He says the impulse of one is attended with the motion of the second. This is the hole that appears to the outward senses. We never see the connection itself. So he says, I'm trying to figure out what is the impression that underlies this idea of causal connection. I can't find it. It's not there in experience. The, the events seem loose and separate. One event follows another, but we can never observe any tie between them. They seem conjoined, but never connected. And here's a sort of joke about that. Don't give me that causal conjunction doesn't imply causal connection. Oh, it's yours. Okay, yes, well, <laughs> never mind. Okay, so instances. From one instance, we infer nothing, but from repeated instances, we infer a causal link. Nothing in the world changes, though, so what does change? Something happens once, then I don't know chance, but suppose it keeps happening. So I keep snapping my fingers. Well, once it was. I snap my fingers, and I clap. 
Okay. Did the snap of the fingers cause the clap? No, right? But suppose I keep doing it. Now you start expecting it, right? And I go, okay. <laughs> okay, so what's happened? Nothing in the world has happened, really. It's your feeling of expectation. Something subjective has happened, something in your mind. You're basically now expecting it. And so if we trace this back to the impression that this idea of causal connection is coming from, it's something inside you. It's not something in the world. You don't observe the connection in the world. In fact, there is no connection really between that and that. It's something that you said that's happening in your mind. You hear the one, you expect the other. And indeed, music depends on this a lot. You have a certain pattern, the pattern repeats, and you expect it. And then maybe it surprises you when there's a break in the picture. But the idea is really, you're generating a feeling of expectation. There's nothing in the music that requires that. You know, that D7 chord does not require being followed by a G chord. You could follow it with something else. But indeed, you start expecting it if you hear it enough. So, here's the idea. The origin of the idea of causation really comes from this constant conjunction of events. Thunder and lightning, or heat and flame, these kinds of things being connected, or just the snapping and the clapping. And then you get a feeling of expectation after repeated instances of this. Eventually, you get the idea of causation. You think this is really causing that to happen. And you get the idea that once this has happened, this one has to happen. You get the idea of necessity out of this. But the origin is not something in the world. If you think about necessity, you say, well, where's necessity in the world? You can't find it. It's not like when I go to drop something, you're going to see what makes it necessary that this falls. Instead, it's just something that is based on your feeling of expectation. I release it, it, it falls, I try to catch it, I fail. You might see me try to catch things repeatedly and you realize, oh yeah, he always fails. <laughs> um, and you infer something about the necessity of that, when in fact, it's not a question of something in the world making that happen, it's really a connection in your head between the ideas. So, this tells us something really dramatic, it says. Necessity and causation are not in the world. Those ideas come from something in us. It is coming from that feeling of expectation within you. That's the origin of these ideas. So he says, look, necessity, causation, these are things that exist in the mind. They do not exist in objects. They do not exist in the world out there. They exist in you. And we are projecting these connections onto the world. We're projecting regularity. We're projecting universality, necessity, causation. Those things aren't in the world. We are projecting them off the world. They are things that are arising from something in us. And not from something rational in us, something from, from the breast, you might say, rather than the head. Something that involves feeling, that feeling of expectation. It is not a question of an inference being performed in your mind. It's a question of a feeling that arises within you. And so the origin is not only not in the world, but in you. It's not in reason. It is within feeling. It's within emotion. It's within what he calls custom or habit. The kind of thing that we tend to do, even though we can't explain why we're doing it or justify it. And so the source is inside us. And he says, this is something we're going to find again and again. We project things onto the world. It's a common observation that the mind has a great propensity to spread itself on external objects and to conjoin with them any internal impressions which they occasion, and which always make their appearance at the same time these objects discover themselves in the senses. So we tend to think those things are out there in the world, but they're not. They're really things inside us. So the empiricist in Hume says, yes, the origin of all ideas is an experience. But some ideas, we don't find any experiences that concerns the origin of those. Certainly not out of the world. Some of them, we can't find any source at all. We say those ideas are nonsense. Some, however, we find the source of in ourselves. It turns out that's not only necessity and causation, it's also things like self, like identity, like morality. And so the source of all of these things turns out to be an internal impression. And then we project them onto the world. Next time, we'll see what this implies about our ideas of ourselves and our ideas of ordinary objects.